Good evening, and welcome to this program, Chinese Americans in the Woods. I'm Laurel Westendorf. I'm part of the community relations team at the Deschutes Public Library. Every month, we explore a theme in our programming, and this month's theme is timber. To find more free programs, please go to our web calendar at deschuteslibrary.org forward slash calendar, or go to our YouTube channel to find recordings of programs like this one. Our presenter tonight is Sue Fan Chung, born and raised in Los Angeles, California. She graduated from UCLA with her BA, Harvard with her AM, and University of California, Berkeley with her PhD. She taught at University of Nevada, Las Vegas in the history department from 1975 to 2014, specializing in Chinese history, Chinese art history, and Chinese American history. She's the author of numerous books, including The Chinese in the Woods, Logging and Lumbering in the American West. Thank you so much, Sue, for sharing the forgotten story of Chinese American experiences in Western lumber camps. Thank you and good evening, everyone. And tonight I'm going to talk about Chinese Americans in the woods, in the, especially in the American West, Nix. When you talk about Nix, She's, yeah, when you talk about the Chinese uh, or any immigrant group, you have to go to their home country and see what is going on there to understand the situation. And here we see a map of Southeast Guangdong province. And this is where most of the 19th century immigrant Chinese Americans came from. You'll note in the green area, it's the four districts. Today it's called the five districts because they added another one. But basically what we see here are Taishan and Kaiping in the middle of the green. And this is the area which will send most of the lumbermen to the American West. We see Jongsan in yellow, just on the border of Macau. And this will be most of the urban merchants who come to the United States. The three districts are to the north of the yellow one, and they present another group who speak a different dialect from the others. And finally, Guangdong in red, just as Hong Kong is. And we will see these are the ports of emigration that is leaving China to the United States. The two brown areas sent very few immigrants to the United States, but they still sent some. China was primarily an agricultural country at this time, but the, but the city looked different from the country and there were cities. And so this is a typical street housing area in South China in the city of Guangzhou or Canton. Now, in this area, they had Don Redwoods, and so the Chinese will take their experience in cutting redwood trees to places like Mendocino, California. And this was, of course, the age of wood products used for buildings, furniture, fuel, transportation, you name it. All kinds of things were made of wood. Now, Chinese temples knew that wood was important for everyone. And so they even grew their own trees or had their own little forests behind the temple or near the temple in order to support the religious activities in the temple. The Chinese used hand tools to saw. There were no mechanical machines to help them at this time and they will continue this trait in the United States. Now, if you went into a village and you wanted to know where was the uh, wood sales or where was the carpenter, all you had to do was look for piles of wood. And sure enough, his shop would be right near the piles of wood. And the Chinese would build very beautiful furniture made of uh, all kinds of redwoods and hardwoods. They used no nails, but it was tongue and groove construction. But they also built rickshaws, chests to carry clothing and so forth, carpenter line tools, just a few of the everyday things made of wood in China at this time. Trees were really respected and honored in China and a typical Chinese landscape painting of the time would include trees and mountains and streams. The love for trees was expressed in poetry, music, literature, individual identity, and you can see this next, in a poem by a seventh century poet named Wang Wei, who wrote, 
on the mountain holiday thinking of my brothers in Shandong. And it could have been written by a Chinese immigrant to America. And it goes, all alone in a foreign land, I am twice as homesick on this day. When brothers carry dogwood up the mountain, each of them a branch, and my branch is missing. Now, in this time period in the 1800s, there were lots of Chinese rebellions against the Manchu, who were nomads, rulers of China at the time. And the Manchus decided that they wanted to get rid of these bandits and rebels, so they burned the forest because these were the strongholds and hiding places of these bandits and rebels. And this, of course, led to great de deforestation, which meant woodcutters had no jobs. And so you can see here that burnt forests uh, that the government did. Also, there were fires, infestations, and a need for growing more agricultural products on limited land. And so they turned a lot of this empty land from that used to be for us into tea plantations beginning in the 1790s. Old wood was on sale, and this is a typical scene. Here you can see the old wood on the side of this, this house and there's uh, this store, and they're making musical instruments with the old wood. But at this time, there was a lot of um, economic, social, and political dislocations, and people were starving because of the flood and famine that resulted at this time. So they were willing to go out and see the world and they were introduced to the Western world who came into China around the 1790s to trade for tea. And in exchange for the trading of tea, they brought wood to China and Asia to build buildings and to rebuild buildings when fire burnt the buildings down. The lumber came on these kinds of ships uh, to Chinese ports from the 1840s on. And you can see lumber is very heavy to transport across the Pacific Ocean. So in order to make ends meet, the uh, lumber ship merchants would, would rent their ship to Chinese merchants in Hong Kong or Canton, who would then fill the ship with whatever they wanted to, and regardless of weight, because it could never weigh as much as the lumber did, and send them over that product over to the United States. And so the trip goes from the Canton area or Guangzhou all the way to San Francisco, costing about $40 to $50 in gold to go to the US and $30 to come back to China if you were sailing on a sailing ship or a steamer. Um, now, if you were a labor contractor, it would only cost you $20 per person to send the person over to the United States. Some people traveled by junks, which was much cheaper. Regardless, the trip took 30 to 100 days, depending upon the weather, the type of vessel and the services. Sailing into the unknown and away from family and friends was very hard for many of the individuals. They would sail on ships like this, owned by the Pacific Mail Steamship Company, the major ship carrying the major shipping line carrying most of the Chinese immigrants to the United States. And eventually, the president was Leland Stanford, one of the big four of the Central Pacific Railroad Company. Crowded, crossing the, the ocean was very, very uh, crowded. This is a typical example of one of the periods when the people could go on deck. And this is a photograph from 1900. They arrived in San Francisco in a very strange place, which looked very different. One of the things that they were familiar with, however, was the fact that many carpenters came building what they called China homes. And you can see these little China homes in between some of the larger structures. And China homes covered many of the cities uh, and areas in the gold country uh, for people who wanted a wooden house. And John Fremont, for example, took two China houses and put them together and made his home in San Francisco out of two homes, two China homes. Most of the travelers, of course, came in steerage class with a trunk. You were only allowed to bring all your possessions in one trunk. But one of the things they liked to bring were seeds for different medicines and herbs and 
plants. And so here we see the tree of heaven, which has become a nuisance by the Forest Service, and the jujube tree. These are samples of trees that came over with many of the immigrants. Uh, most of the immigrants will come over on their own or with the help of family, friends, uh, their, or their organizations. But there were a number of labor contractors who also brought over a lot of Chinese, including Sisson Wallace and Company, which made millions or thousands of dollars from their Chinese labor that they provided. And the labor contractor, Jin He Ji, whose Hua Chung Company in Seattle, Washington also brought Chinese from Guangdong to fill the need for railroad construction, mining, logging, and other labor-intensive pro projects. Chinese immigration, most of the people landed in San Francisco after 1848, but realized that there were Chinese in the United States prior to this time, and some of them had settled in different parts of the United States. Seattle and Portland became the next entry points after San Francisco. The original attraction was mining and then railroad construction. And both of these industries needed wood and required lots of wood and people to cut the wood. And so this is where some of the occupation for woodcutters and lumberers would come from. By 1880, there were 75,000 plus Chinese in California, 9,510 in Oregon, and 3,186 in Washington, most involved in mining, logging, service industries, laundries, and restaurants. But there were also merchants, doctors, dentists, carpenters, uh, painters, and a whole host of other occupations. Gold was discovered in California in 1848-49 and then in Oregon in 1850 and 51. And so news spread to Southern China about this discovery of gold. And even today, the Chinese think that American streets are paved with gold. But these miners were taxed heavily during the early years. And for example, one fourth of the local government's budget in Jacksonville, Oregon was made up of the taxes that they collected from the Chinese miners. Chinese miners were very migratory and they went from mine area to mine area, starting in Josephine and Jackson counties and then Douglas and Grant counties. They were usually undercounted, so we never know how many Chinese there were, but in this 1860 photograph of a Chinese miner, you can see he carries a shoulder pole with his long tom, tom divided in half, and again, wood products for mining. Chinese miners often work together in multi-ethnic crews. This is a picture of them in Tuscarora, Nevada in the 1870s to 1890s. And this was not unusual except in California where the Chinese tended to minor in their own groups. And in Grant County, we see companies of Chinese miners mining together. Now, people realize that as the country grew and as communities grew, there was need for fuel, for heating, for stamp mills, for making houses, for doing all kinds of other things. And so in 1859, like many entrepreneurs, James and Andrew Walmsley on the Comstock hired Chinese woodcutters to cut cord wood, make wood charcoal, and become freighters in logging in the early uh, in the late 19th century to early 20th century. And Andrew Wamsey's son uh, told me about how close their family felt to all of the Chinese woodcutters that worked for them in this period. Now, cordwood, you might not know what it is, is used for, for fuel and it's cut four feet high, eight feet long and four feet deep. And the Chinese would cut the, this cordwood. And here is a photograph of cordwood left in sight uh, for 140 years. I took this picture in 2000. Notice the stump on the side. The difference between a Chinese woodcutter and a Western woodcutter is that the Western woodcutter would cut the stump very short and the Chinese woodcutter would leave the stump taller. The Chinese also used wood for irrigation projects. And so here you see an 18th century woodcut print showing you how to make 
a, a water wheel to move the water. And here you see an actual picture of men uh, making the water rise through a watering system. A lot of irrigation product projects were built for agriculture, especially in California and Oregon and Washington. And it was, of course, using wood. And so one of the most famous was the Big Gap Flume in Groveland, California. It was 2,200 feet long, had 11 towers, and was built in 1859 to 1860 for the agricultural products or the farmers in the area. Now, the Chinese and other people also lived in wooden cabins. And this is a typical Chinese wooden cabin using no nails, but a tongue and groove. And this was a miner's cabin in Bloomfield, California with a tin roofing. Now the tin roofing was hard to obtain. So if he moved, he would take the roof with him, but leave the cabin to disintegrate or in time. Now this is a boarding house for loggers and miners in Bennettville, just outside, just near Yosemite National Park. It was restored by the Forest Service, but in the 1880s, the top floor was used for the, the men to sleep in, and the bottom floor was where the horses and other animals were stabled. And so they also cut wood, and this is one of the areas where they left their wood uh, cut in the 1880s and, and the photograph in 2009. And we know it's a Chinese site because of the ceramic shards and other Chinese products that surround this cord, this area of wood cut. And again, the stump is higher than, it, uh, than a Western logger would do. And again, wood was used for mining equipment and for fuel for the mines. And you can see this wheel and the stamp mill and the, the silver mines, of course, were great at using uh, timber. And this is in Virginia City. Even when they went to hydraulic uh, mining, which eventually was banned, thank goodness, for ecological reasons, they still had to cut and clear the area. And so you can see the trees in the front that were cut down by the people doing the mining. Now, some merchants became very wealthy and they could dress in fur-lined silk and clo clothing and they had silk down, which is um, light down, but even warmer, uh, which they wore in the winter months. And this is in 1870 to 1890. This is Ali Lake of Tuscarora, Nevada. Now, Chinese businessmen were required to have papers, partnership papers by the Bureau of Immigration. And so this is one for Qin Hua, who was the manager and partner in a firm called Tai Li and Company. And he worked there for seven years and they were wood and charcoal dealers in San Francisco in the 1880s to 1890s. Note that three of his partner or three of the men owning the business were Qin's and one was Zheng Li who was probably related to Qin Hua. At first, cordwood was put on the back of mules to transport down the hills to the mines, to the mills, but then oxen and horses were also used. And so here is a, a group of mules, but this is a more fantastically large group of mules carrying wood uh, by China Tom in 1882 to Bodie, California, a mining town. Connected with mining and wood are railroad construction and wood. And railroad construction began in earnest in the early 1850s, drawing more Chinese immigrants to the United States. The biggest employer in this, these early days was the Central Pacific Railroad, which started in Sacramento and went eastward um, to Ogden. Now it became the first transcontinental railroad when it met the Union Pacific in Promontory, but it continued to be built to the station in Ogden today. And we see the wood was needed for ties, for depots, train cars, freight containers, you name it, lots of products. And then other lines were built, both intrastate and interstate, all of them or almost all of them using Chinese labor and wood in the area. And one of the nice things about the West is that they had lots of wood. And we will see a lot of clear cutting uh, done at this time for the building of the trains. 
In 1866, the Central Pacific Railroad used 200 tons of lumber per day for ties. And later there were numerous other uses for tie, for, for lumber that the train needed. And the ties had to be replaced every four to five years until eventually uh, a solution, a chemical was developed to preserve the ties for longer than four to five years. You can see this kind of construction as they lay the ties and then the tracks, as they went across Nevada with the superintendent, James Harvey Strobridge. Massive trees could be logged at this time, just as massive trees had been logged in China. And whenever you graded the road for the railroads, you also had to cut down the trees and clear the roads. And you could build trestles and bridges that were made of wood. This secret town, California trestles, is one of the most dramatic. You had to build the land up, level it, and then build the bridge. But there were many of these wooden bridges and trestles throughout the Western United States. And of course, most of them didn't survive because they were made of wood. But the Cedar River trestle in Washington had a 203 foot high wall of wood, and it was usually redwood, which the Chinese were very familiar with how to cut and treat redwood. They made wooden train cars, they made wagons, carts, other modes of transportation, even the wheels are made of wood. Barrels, uh, crates, furniture, wood for everything. And even the Chinese used wood for their cemetery markers. Now, the most common type of housing for the loggers were tents or wooden cabins. One diarist wrote that you could build a cabin in the forest in one day, and the only part that you had to move from one location to another was the roof because it was harder to construct. The Chinese loggers often lived and worked with other ethnic groups at the wood camps. Sunday was a day to relax, to chat, and if you worked for the Central Pacific, and many of the loggers did, uh, you got a free chicken dinner uh, as a, an enticement. Now, you might say, well, chicken, that's sort of ordinary. But in China, a chicken is a feast day meal only. So it was like every Sunday there was a feast meal. Now, the Sierra Wood Camp is another example of the, the workers living in a wooden cabin or house or boarding house, and the surrounding um, forest is being denuded. And you can see this at the Trunk Truckee Lumber and Camp. Now, Truckee was a major train stop. It was a major center for communications. And 90% of the loggers in the area in the 1870s were Chinese, probably from Taishan. The Chinese worked at sawing the lumber on site sometimes. And we see in archaeological finds the different things that were found, uh, such as the trees that were uncut, that were cut and left there, um, reusable items in the bottom center, um, log cabins destroyed to the foreground in the upper right. But the trains also used a lot of wood charcoal. And here is the Confucian steam engine. Uh, this steam engine locomotive number 77 was called Confucius, Confucius, honoring the Chinese by naming it after their fourth century BC philosopher. The forests around Lake Tahoe today are second or third growth forests, not the original growth because most of it was denuded next or cut, clear cut. But we do have a picture of a Chinese crew uh, on a Tahoe wood ranch, and this comes from the 1890s. The ranch owner is on your far right. Next. And you can see them as they cut lumber on these ranches. This was Chubak's Sierra house in Tahoe. These mighty trees, Douglas fir, redwoods, and trees like this, were favorite trees for railroad construction. And Crocker would even try to get the Native Americans to sell him their forest land so that he could cut the trees from their lands as well. 
The Virginia and Trucking Railroad was one of the smaller trains that was built uh, in order basically to carry the gold and silver out of the richest mine in the United States at the time, the Comstock mine. And they transported cords of wood 44 times a day at its height to the Comstock mines. There were people who built these smaller lines, such as Dwayne Bliss and his partner, Henry Yarrington, who not only were in the railroad construction business, but also in the lumber business. And so we see that Yarrington and Bliss did the Tahoe Lumber and Fluming Company, the Virginia and Truckee Railroad, the Carson and Colorado Railroad, and the Benton and Bodie Railroad. Yarrington is an interesting character. Not only is he a part owner of the company, but he also owns sawmills, mines, and other property, all, almost all of them employing Chinese workers. He married Charles Crocker, one of the big four, his niece. And so he was in with or networked with the big four of the Central Pacific. And this is the Carson Tahoe and Lumber Flute and Flume Company. And you can see the train engine in the center of the photograph, miles of wood, very expensive and making them a lot of money. Now, these uh, wood barons and railroad barons also worked with Chinese. And so this labor contractor, Yi Chong Nong, also known as Sam Gibson by most of his friends, owned a store selling goods to Euro-American Euro lumbermen. He had two boarding houses, a restaurant, and horses and wagons, which put him in the middle class of Carson City. He and his wife had three children who were educated in the Carson City public school system because the superintendent had been treated medically by a Chinese physician and decided that he would let Chinese children go to public school, unlike San Francisco, who segregated their public schools. He was a good friend of Dwayne Bliss and Henry Yarrington, and Bliss even went to China to visit him when Yi Chong Nung decided to retire back to China. Bodhi and Benton train was primarily a logging train, taking the logs up to Bodhi where there were no trees. And you can see the line going uh, to the mill as well. And Mono Lake here, if you're familiar with uh, this part of California. Although most Chinese workers uh, worked in the mill in Western clothes, whenever they had their forward portrait uh, taken, they often liked to wear Chinese clothes. So you can't tell whether they're wearing Western clothes or not. When you have to prepare the logs for fluming, it's a lot of hard work. And you send the logs down a stream of water and Chinese flumers were usually hired for this job. You'd set, stand on the edges of the flume, watch the log go down the center and if it jammed up with other logs, you were in charge of unjamming them. And believe me, this was a skill and a dangerous occupation because some of the logs would be going 75 miles an hour down the stream. So the Forest Service excavated a little cabin in Clear Creek Flume near Carson City, and Fred Frampton excavated the, the foundation of this cabin, found that there was an outside stove uh, and for high heat cooking and a in an inside stove probably for heating things and cooking soup and things like that. We found out that a lot of the forest workers um, could buy very high quality eating dishes and, and other products because of course they were so isolated that they didn't have a lot to spend their money on. So when they went to the, to the nearest community to buy things, they, they could buy the best of whatever was for sale. Incline's Sierra Mill Lumber Mill has its flume coming under the S, you can see it, coming straight down the mountain. This is one of the flumes where the logs went 75 miles an hour down to the, the sawmill. But some had their, their logs collected in ponds, such as the Verde Lumba, Lumber Company and some on the side of the hillside in Truckee.
Now, oxen were used to carry the big logs. Horses were used. And trains eventually were used. At first, the freighters who were Chinese uh, would use mules, horses, and, and so forth. But eventually, they worked on the, the what we call log transportation trains, loading and unloading the logs and riding down the trains from the hillside. Now, a lot of these, these logging trains were narrow gauge railroads that went deep into the forest with sharp curves, up and down steep grades. And after the trains were built, the camps were established. And usually there were several camps along the route of the um, logging train. And the Chinese, if the owner liked the work that the Chinese did, he hired them to also cut wood, but he would also place them at the furthest camp from the depot or the main place where everything was uh, going on. And here you can see a logging train going through the forest in 1899. Still a lot of forest being cut. And one of the interesting ones that you can ride on today is the Yosemite Mountain Sugar Pine Railroad, which had half of its construction workers as Chinese, and the cooks for the camp were also Chinese, and they had their own cookhouse, which has been preserved. But in the 1852 period and way into the 1880s, anti-Chinese movements abound. There was a lot of violence, a lot of racism, a lot of discrimination, a lot of prejudice, next. And there were no equal rights uh, for men and Chinese couldn't be naturalized. They couldn't testify in court against Euro-Americans. In most, most places, they couldn't even own land. Next. Uh, and the violence spread to Oregon, to Portland, to Hell's Canyon Snake River, even after the Exclusion Act. It didn't abate until maybe 1900, but even then after 1900, there were a lot of anti-Chinese movements. But the Chinese could own forest land in Nevada, and they had to sue in a famous case in 1880, in which the court decided in 1883 that the Chinese could open, could own wood ranches in Nevada. And that may be a reason for why there were a lot of loggers who were Chinese in Nevada. Another activity related to wood was the making of wood charcoal for fuel for trains, mining equipment, stoves, heating homes, and so forth. Now, this is a typical traditional Chinese wooden kill dating from the Neolithic period. But eventually they will use a long uh, 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 kiln like this in this 18th century woodblock print. Now, why were they interested in making wood charcoal? Well, they also used the soot from the top of the uh, kiln to make the Chinese ink. And we know Chinese ink existed uh, before the fourth century BC and is still used today. So 350 of these kilns were found in 2000 near Truckee, California by archeologist Susan Lindstrom. She was able to preserve a few of them on the land that was used for housing developments. And many of the kilns in the Truckee area, Susan has determined were owned by mining companies or railroad companies. And they had to be tended. And so sometimes they would do it in these Italian style beehive kilns. And there were several of these kilns uh, in Mount Charleston near Las, uh, Las Vegas, Nevada in the 1870s, next. And Desert Death Valley, a whole bunch of places. And you can always find out where there was wood charcoal being made. If you look on the ground and you see a piece of wood charcoal left at a kiln site. Now, wood was also sold to the homes uh, at, by these peddlers, Nicks. And they would, Nicks, and they would go to your house and mark on your porch whether or not you bought a load of wood so that they could come and collect the money later on. Now, there were lumber yards 
in San Francisco's Chinatown, there were three major ones, but you would never know this because as you walk down the streets, you wouldn't see them, but they would be in the center of two streets. As you can see here, the lumber yard in yellow. There's also wood storage, uh, Chinese launder, uh, lodging uh, next to a tailor, and, you know, a whole host of different things going on, but the lumber yards in the center. Lumber was an occupation for many Chinese in many places. And even today, Honolulu's Zane KF Lumber Company still exists uh, and it originally got most of its lumber from Oregon. And it's one of the biggest construction companies on the islands next. And another famous uh, lumber yard was that of John Wright's. He took an American name in Nicaragua, Nicaragua. And he's shown here in 1940 among his redwood lumber yard. Uh, and the lumber yard is still owned by the clan today. Now, in addition to these people in, in logging, we have people who work in the forest. And Tai Singh, who was born in 1864 in uh, Virginia City, uh, was the Chinese cook for Stephen Mather in the Yosemite National Park and for the Geological Society. He was raised by uh, Judge Thomas Howley in Carson City and so he was fluent in English, could compose in English, and was uh, well represented in his American ways. And here in the bottom right, you see a group having dinner with Stephen Mather at the head of the table. All of these men will contribute to the development in the next two years uh, for the Forest Service and the National Park Service. So there's a lot of, and one of the, and one of the reasons was the great food that Tai Singh cooked. Oh, here he is. And so there's a book about Tai Singh called Mountain Chef, how one man uh, accomplished a lot of different things. And you might wonder, well, how did the Chinese learn to cook American food? And there were a number of cookbooks doing Chinese and English at the same time so that the Chinese cook could learn what tea was, what percolated coffee was, and so on and so forth. And that's how they got to be such excellent cooks. Plus, people from Guangdong province were noted for their outstanding cooking. And so a lot of cooks, Chinese cooks, were hired by lumber camp owners, and the lumberjacks had a hearty appetite. And it was not unusual for one man to eat three steaks, six pork chops, lots of mashed potatoes, and three pieces of pie for dinner in the late 19th century. And so one of the favorite things was apple pie. And in one camp in Washington, uh, the labor union got to the owner of the, of the lumber camp and said, oh, you've got to fire your Chinese. And he turned to them and he said, well, I'll hire you to cook, but you have to meet the requirements that my Chinese cooks have met. And he told the Chinese cooks to the side, don't go away. These guys aren't going to do it. And so the requirement was to make 100 pies a day in addition to the dinner. And the Amer Euro Americans couldn't do it. So the Chinese cook were rehired and the lumbermen were once again happy uh, eating the food cooked by the Chinese cook. This also occurred in mining. And so the story is told in the legend of Auntie Po. And this again is a child's book, fictional account, but it is a very delightful book to read. So the Chinese cooks could be found in lumber camps, railroad construction camps, hotels, depots, minings. Uh, in one hotel in, in Yosemite, they made $100 a month. So your cooks were paid at a higher scale than your ordinary construction worker. And using a Chinese cleaver over a wooden stump, a Chinese cook in Idaho is still making use of his wooden chopping block in 1920, just as I still make use of my wooden chopping block when I cook. And we see the Chinese population being relatively small after the 1882 and 1892 Exclusion Acts, and it kept going downward and will not achieve any kind of, of uh, equity or 
growth until the 1970s and the turn of the 21st century. Lumber is still sold today in Chinatowns. And so here is a sign that I came across when I was walking in New York's Chinatown a couple of years ago. The forest lands are all second and third generation growths. It's very sad to see that uh, and to realize that there was clear cutting of the forest in, in this era. So we say goodbye to the mighty forests of the Tahoe area, which had been clear cut. And we see that the Chinese had to depart, not only because of immigration laws and taxations, but also advances in technology, the large corporations taking over from the small firms, deforestation, the hard work and living conditions for lumbermen, the migratory nature of the work, and of course, discrimination and uh, violence. So why are the Chinese in the woods significant? One has to ask, could the American West have developed as quickly without the Chinese in the mines, railroad construction, logging, building roads, cooking, uh, transitory jobs, doing laundry, performing other tasks? These men, though they were instrumental in helping develop the American West and helping in its settlement and in its industrialization, were forgotten and are seldom in books or in newspaper accounts. Their contributions have only been recognized recently, but we need to have more of it acknowledged through museums, histories, and teaching. And so if you want to learn more about the Chinese in the woods, you can read my book, uh, Chinese in the Woods, Logging, it should be Chinese Americans in the Wood, Logging and Lumbering in the American West. Thank you for your attention. And if I don't get to your question tonight, you can email me at chung at unlv.nevada.edu. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Sue. I know that we have a couple of those kids' books that you mentioned in oh, our good. collection. And uh, yeah, I love that story of the, the gentleman that cooked for the, uh, to, basically it was a huge part of creating Yosemite National Park. Right. By, by feeding people's bellies. Okay, we have one question here. Did any women come with the men and did the men ever go home and visit China? Okay. Um, women seldom came to America at this time for two reasons. One, there was a law called the Page Law of 1875, which if you were a married woman, you had to prove to the American consulate in Hong Kong that you were not a prostitute. So if you can imagine how hard it was for a village woman who knew very little English to prove that she wasn't a prostitute to an American government official, you knew it was very discouraging. Plus, you had to pay for your trip into Hong Kong and pay for your trip back if you didn't get your visa to go to the United States. Secondly, the women who did come over in the free immigration period found that living in the United States in the American West was really too hard for them. They didn't have family to support them. They didn't have servants. Every, a lot of Chinese had servants at this time. They didn't have servants to support them. If they had bound feet, like my grandmother did, where could you walk? You know, you couldn't walk up and down hills. Um, you had a hard time moving around. So it was a very lonely life. And they preferred staying in China, uh, even if they had to live with their mother-in-law and father-in-law, which I would never do. But, you know, <laughs> things like that uh, made it difficult. So we don't see uh, an equality in the sex ratio until 1970. But way back in 1880, in some towns, it was 300 men to every Chinese woman. a very small number of women in the United States. And then women were undercounted by the census. So men tended to hide the fact that there was a woman in his house because he didn't want other people to know that uh, there was because she could be kidnapped uh, and made to marry someone else. Well, the boat ride alone, you know, 30 to 100 days, that's, that's a huge amount of time. It could be a third of a year. Right. Almost. Especially for a woman, you know, who has all kinds of needs and privacy and issues and so forth. So it was very difficult. Were the Chinese involved in the building of the Delta area? 
Yes, they were very instrumental. And of course, California would not be such a great agricultural state had the Chinese not built the levees and the trains uh, in the Delta area. And there were colonies of Chinese and people would say, oh, well, they didn't interact with other people. But of course, you couldn't be isolated. You had to have somebody in your community being able to communicate with the larger community to buy eggs from the chickens that were raised by other people, to buy ducks and so forth. And so we see that there was always someone in every community who could interact with the larger community. And in um, Walnut Grove itself, one of the people that I know, Lamban, had 800 acres of pear trees. And they, you know, this was an amazing amount of agricultural production. You mentioned uh, that some of these men brought over you know, traditional plants from China. Was, China. was traditional Chinese medicine practiced in the mining and lumber camps? Oh, yes. Everyone knew a little bit about how to cure a bad cold or how to cure a stomach ache. And in fact, they shared their stomach ache medicine with the non-Chinese. And so you see lots of these little bottles of what we call, we used to call them red gunshots. You know, they're little round red pills. And if you had dysentery or any kind of stomach problem, uh, you just swallowed a bottle full of this stuff. And you were basically within a couple of days, you had no trouble whatsoever. It was so effective that it was widespread in the Chinese community and the non-Chinese community that experienced this kind of stomach problem. What was the reason for the difference in height for the stumps between Western and Chinese lumbermen? Well, I've heard different reasons, and I've never really consulted Fred Frampton about this, but one is that the Chinese didn't want to cut it all the way down because then you'd never have any trees growing. And so if you kept the stump higher, the theory was that a tree could grow out of that stump of a tree. Um, the others is, is that the uh, Western, um, the Euro-American lumbermen like to cut it all the way down so that no other tree would grow, you know, so, but you could tell the difference. I mean, I, I never noticed it until I went walking in the forest and looked at the stumps of different sizes. Yeah, I noticed it right away. I was like, oh, that is a huge difference. <laughs> Right. It must be harder to, you know. <laughs> I, I, I don't like, know. <laughs> um, there's a woman here that says, I was recently at Yosemite for the opening of the Chinese laundry house. I heard someone say that it was illegal for Chinese to work in Yosemite, so they were working illegally at that time. Is that true? Um, the Chinese couldn't work in public works projects. Yosemite was not a public works project, okay? So no, it wasn't true that they were illegally there. Um, they were working in the laundry. She went to the opening of the Chinese laundry at Wawona and the Chinese uh, worked in laundry everywhere. And it was a wonderful occupation for them because in China, the traditional village cloth maker and dye maker was out of a job when Western industrial cloth came into China in the 1830s on. So they had no occupation. I mean, it was cheaper to buy manufactured cloth than to weave the cloth for the people. They came to the United States and they, they used their skill in working with cloth and washing cloth and ironing cloth to do laundry work, especially for the hotels and the wash burns in Wawona Hotel employed a whole host of Chinese doing the laundry work for the hotels, but this was also common in other hotels throughout the West. We have a couple of questions about, you know, who did the Chinese lumbermen and miners, did they marry from other Chinese uh, groups or other non-Chinese? Oh, this is another interesting aspect. Because there were so few women, if they could not save enough money or they did not want to go back home, 
And the assumption was that they all wanted to go back home and they all married women that were uh, back in China. Um, what really happened was that half of the men who came to work on the railroad of the Carson in Colorado were married, but they had left their wives at home in the hopes that they could go back. But a lot of them couldn't afford to go back. They hadn't saved enough money. It cost too much to go back. And so what we see happening is they would look for any young girl uh, who was Chinese, and that was your first choice of a wife. But also we see that as they cross, as the workers on the Central Pacific cross through Nevada and Native Americans join them in working on the Central Pacific, they met a lot of Native American women. And we see some Native American women marriages uh, occurring between Chinese and Native Americans, both Shoshone and Paiutes. Um, and this was not prohibited by law. But in 1861 in Nevada, for example, you, you as a Chinese person were prohibited from cohabitating or marrying a Euro-American. Um, and you could be arrested uh, if you were found in any kind of situation like that. And your partner would be arrested too. So interracial marriage was discouraged, except among uh, Chinese and Portuguese. Don't ask me how the Portuguese get in this. Uh, Mexicans, Chinese, uh, Native Americans and Chinese, and African American and Chinese. This was sanctioned. Others were not. Hmm. It's odd. <laughs> uh, someone had a question about... Um, tunnels in Elko, Nevada, um, to potentially hide Chinese Americans. Do you know about that? Yeah, I know. it. There are a lot of tunnels throughout Chinatowns everywhere. Uh, and one of the reasons for the tunnels was to go from X building to Y building without going above on the street in cold weather. Remember, the Chinese come from a warm climate. They're not used to the cold. So they use these tunnels to go from one place to another. The other thing is they knew that they should store different things underground. And so if you were going to can pumpkin or peaches or tomatoes, you wanted it in a dark place. Now, the Americans took these tunnels to say, oh, this is where the Chinese are smoking opium. And it wasn't necessarily true. Certainly there was some smoking of opium, but majority of the tunnels were used for storage uh, and for uh, going from one location to another in Chinatown. And one uh, restaurant owner that I met in Carlin, Nevada said, oh, they used to say that, you know, opium smoking was going on in my tunnel, but that was my coal chute. And I preserved my coal for cooking in the basement in the tunnel. And then we would go and get the coal and use it because I ran the restaurant 24 hours for the uh, railroad workers and the passengers who came through Carlin. So you never know what's true and what's not. I like the idea that it's not really nefarious, but just practical. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sue, this has been a joy having you and to hear you share your vast knowledge on Chinese American history in logging and mining. Um, and we want to thank you for, for talking with us tonight and uh, sticking around for some questions. We wish we could have had you in Bend. So. Oh, listen, listen, I wanted to come to Bend so badly. But anyway, <laughs> maybe the next time. Okay. Maybe next Take time. Care. Thank you yeah. so much for inviting me. And thank you for joining us in this lecture. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your night. Bye. Bye.